Blob Matrix, Season 1, Episode 9, Jackson, Take 1, Mark. That was good. You know, I've <laughs> been clapping all my life. Who do you think has a louder clap, me or you? Well, do you want to see who can do a louder clap? Like, if I'm trying, then I'm going to... You're not going to win. You think you can clap loud? Okay, you only get one. One try. Oh, I, gotta... I think I can have you beat. Hello and welcome to Plot Matrix. This is a follow along screenwriting podcast. Over the course of a season, we are gonna be developing a movie idea into a script with your help. And on this season, we're developing a movie about a fictional treasure hunt industry. It's kind of like a action comedy is the genre, right? Yeah. Well, we have already established our antagonist, which is this company that has been winning the treasure hunt every single year. But today, we are defining our underdogs, our heroes, our protagonists. Our protagonists? Ists? Our heroes? Yes. There's three, which we'll get into. It is a team of three. Yeah. I wanted to do a team of ten, and then I realized I didn't want to have to write ten equally developed characters. I mean, you needed my help to come up with these three. It's true. Yeah. It's nice. It's nice just shoveling work onto you as I, you know, come here to talk. Well, also, after us working on this podcast and this being in our head for like four months or something it is like overdue for us to give you our heroines definitely and then we uh and then we're gonna let this channel die here yeah this is it this is the final episode i know we said we were gonna follow through no matter what but that's it hope you enjoyed and uh let's play the outro music now but seeing as we are confirming some stuff today, the first thing I want to do is actually confirm the type of protagonist we're doing and how they got there. Now, I know we had bounced around a couple ideas of it being the grand team via the puzzle or the grand team that had found the clue. But what we are settling on today is that the grand team is through a puzzle program. So this was an idea that came to us from my friend Connor who told us about, what was it called, Circadian? Uh, it's, I think it's 3001, Circadian 3001. Yeah, and it was basically an open... Uh, Cicada 3001. Cicada 3001. Cicada 3301. <laughs> <laughs> God, that is just fascinating radio we're making. Yeah. In our story, Linwood puts out a puzzle open to the public, and if people solve it successfully, correctly then they get entered into the treasure hunt. Correct. Which other people have to win a raffle and then pay for. So the puzzle is timed. Uh, it's not like a you know 30-minute type of LinkedIn assessment quiz. It is a full-on year-long puzzle. So it'll lead up until the time where the other contestants are being notified of their acceptance in the raffle program. Uh, so that's how long you have to do it. It's a multi-part puzzle. So you have to solve, much like the actual treasure hunt, a couple of clues in order to get to the final prompt. Mm -hmm. And then in that final prompt, you only have one submission attempt. So you have to be certain that what you're submitting is the correct answer because you can't go back and change it after. And if you complete this puzzle in the first week, you still wait for that final moment until they acknowledge the fact that you have reached it. The acceptance day. Yeah, exactly. But even though if you imagine it being multi-part, We should mention that the reason this was created is, I think, Linwood's response to criticism of the incumbency of Dennis Hudson's team and just the general elitism. I still don't think it should require the uh, entrance to have like resources at their disposal. I don't I don't think it's like a physical hunt that they have to do because this exists because this is supposed to be like the, the meritocracy entrance into the treasure hunt that is supposed to reward um underdogs who don't have the the money to throw at fighting the treasure hunt but can just get in on their own smarts it's a total moonshot and the likelihood of anyone getting it is so slim but you know we have it there and because we have it there that makes us a better more approachable company yeah so with it being a response to criticism i would say that linwood is not expecting this team to probably perform very well but at all it's probably used in marketing i mean we've talked about linwood not being very responsive but uh we had this idea of the game master so i would say that this is a new era for linwood 
and they're trying to be more responsive to criticism through the creation of this grant program. Yeah, definitely. But it, it, to me, it still feels like a half-hearted attempt uh, because I imagine the puzzle is so difficult that they really don't expect anybody to get it. Oh, they're just not expecting anybody to. Right. I think it's it's something that they do in principle without thinking that they were going to actually have to pay it out. Which just reminds me of really, I mean, the, the, the thing I had in mind when I um, liked this idea, which is the fact that rich people can basically just say, oh, there's still economic mobility. I did it oh, why don't you just go to community college and work nights and weekends? And like, basically, just because you technically can rise up in America uh, doesn't mean that it's like an easy thing to do. Or it's guaranteed it's going to happen, which is how a lot of these people speak about it. Besides the economic comparison, I think another one that it might be suitable for this is the social comparison of something like in the NFL, there's this thing called the Rooney rule. And the Rooney rule is whenever there's an open coaching position, they've expanded it now to be like position coaches as well, but it used to just be head coaches. Uh, you had to interview a person of color for the head coaching job, right? They did that to try to counteract the fact that there are almost, I think, I think 29 out of the coaches, the 32 or 30, however many the coaches there are, are white. And there are very few people of color that ever get to a leadership position like that. So teams will go and they'll say, oh, well, we interviewed uh, this one candidate, but we're going to go with this other white guy. Now coaches are trying to make the point that the rule is just there in name. We don't. It doesn't actually generate any change like they're hoping to, but the NFL is using it as an out to say, look, we're encouraging diversity. You know, This is the most that we can do. We can't actually push the teams to hire these people. They have to go with whoever's best. And that's something that this puzzle sort of felt like to me in that same response, which is just, you know, we're putting this out there. So we're, we're doing our part. We're doing everything we can. If people don't get it, it's not our fault. You know, we can't make it any easier than we already have to get into this competition. These alternative doors to like get into top roles and companies or things like that, these like fast track programs, um, the design of them is going to inherently disadvantage people from marginalized communities. Right. The bias is baked into the system where if you just imagine for us, well, if the the cipher, the puzzle that you need to solve is in English and has like um, English idioms and characteristics and um, novel references, then of course that's like, obviously not the point definitely you eliminate so many people deliberately pretty much by putting it that way but you can just play it off in in whatever circumstances you want so do you think that the puzzle is based in linguistics and is english i think it's a a factor of it okay i think this is something we could definitely discuss because and we're about to get into the characters itself i'll just give these overarching character strokes that we thought of here while we're already on the topic i'll just say we haven't defined the characters names or where they're from yet We're going to get into that afterwards. What we wanted was to just get the characteristics of the type of people we wanted to examine and then do the actual research to put them in that place or from that place. But what we do have is a, if we decide on the number of three characters, correct. we sort of figured out the dynamic we wanted them to have and then sort of work backwards to figure out what each one of those characters would would represent and what motivates them. Although we haven't decided the specific countries yet, we have wholeheartedly agreed no Americans on this team because we want to counteract what we're already saying with the Hudson team and everything that comes with them. And maybe, you know, if we go with the undercover Fed plot line that comes in there, we have more Americans. So I think we're America out. I think we have enough America Mm -hmm. all over this. So I think putting our three protagonists from countries from, you know, not the maybe not even European countries, but countries from any other part of the world could make this a lot more interesting for us in general, but we have to research and bring these characters to life, but also maybe get some people who aren't normally on screen on screen. Okay. Do you want to give us the overview of the three? Yep. All right, let's do it. So I'm going to go over our protagonist protagonist, our team leader, if we will. Mm -hmm. And for each one of these characters, we're going to begin by sharing their motivation and then share a few more of their character traits as well. So far, what we have imagined, we're going to go with the name Alice. Yeah, we can't name her Alice without like having an Alice in Wonderland like uh, reference. Like people will... We're not naming her Alice. I'm I'm vetoing okay. Alice now. This is our, our temp holder name. Okay, 
That's fine. That's fine. And Alice's motivation here is improving her station in life for her, her family, and her community. And for that, we imagine that she is a woman from a marginalized community. Uh, she's charismatic, but she's a little bit more serious because this is not a fun endeavor for her. It's a genuine opportunity to change her life and make an impact on the people around her. Obviously, they're they're competing for a lot of money and they're taking it seriously, but I think she views this really not as a last-ditch effort, but as taking it for what it is. I think the other two might be a little bit more relaxed about the competition because while they have a lot to gain from it, they don't necessarily have the circumstances that she comes from. Okay. Part of what comes from that, though, is that she refuses to take advantage of people or any morally ambiguous circumstances because she knows the impact that it can have from where she's from. I kind of imagine that maybe at some point the treasure hunt went through her town, her village, her city, whatever it was, when she was a kid. And she saw the chaos that resulted from it. And that's how she found out about the contest, but also how she found out about the dark side of everything that could happen. Um, and I imagine that she is the team leader. She's the most physically coordinated compared to the other two. Uh, but she's really good at balancing the other skills that they bring. Mm -hmm. So right off the bat, the thing that jumps out the most to me is something that's obviously really planted in our story. And that's the fact that she might have seen the treasure hunt go through her community when she was a kid. What are your thoughts on that? I don't know if that feels a little bit too cliche, a little bit too, oh, you know, you see this horrific image when you're a child and then it consumes your whole life. I don't know if that feels too on the nose or if it seems like in this world it would make sense that, you know, when this opportunity arose to compete in the puzzle competition, she would leap at it. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if that's entirely necessary um, because, I mean, one thing that I should say about all three of these characters there's this big character trait that's just baked into all of them. They were able to solve a very difficult puzzle that nobody else in the planet that attempted it was able to solve. I think we forgot to mention, there is no cap to this grant team. If 100 people got the puzzle correct, then there would be 100 people on this team. But for this specific competition, it was only these three that got it right. Okay, so all three characters, incredibly smart, yeah, very talented, smart in different ways. But all of them need this money resource that they have to use to work together. So, like in reference to all the like layers of conflict that we that I went over last week, there's going to be in some intergroup conflict as well. Definitely. What is the relationship between her and the other two characters? Like, because three characters is this good number where each one of them has just another relationship with the other two. We need to basically put a word or a sentence defining each relationship. Yeah. Well, let's let's go through the other two because I think it'll be easier to discuss the three of them in contrast to each other. All right. Well, then let me kick it over to you to do the next one because I know this was a character that you personally really wanted to introduce to this team. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I had the idea for this character because of what I wanted them to represent in terms of our team. So right now we're calling this character Jane and we're saying that she's around 21 years old, basically just a couple of years out of high school. Her motivation for the treasure hunt is to be able to get the money so that she basically doesn't have to work for the rest of her life. What's she going to do with her life then? Well, that's really, that's the point, isn't it? Yeah. So it's not that she's lazy. Like laziness in general is like such a capitalistic invention no one wants to have to work okay obviously people want to work i want to work i enjoy what i do nobody wants to have to work okay so my thought for jane was that she is less social a little socially awkward and not so confident but something about her and that dynamic means that she has trouble holding down a job she's just she wasn't born and put on this earth with the kind of brain and social skills to hold down a job. And my point is that that's okay. And that that's not something that she has to change the uh, growth over the project. So I imagine that she has this tension with her parents where they gave her the space to have her head in the clouds a little bit throughout her school. But after she graduated and had maybe a couple attempts at working uh she's ended up just sort of settling into to living with them and so her working on this puzzle would have been one of the things that her parents 
were putting pressure on her like why are you working so hard trying to solve a puzzle just to get into a treasure hunt that you're not guaranteed to win instead of just getting a job so like the the policy diagnosis to this is ubi or universal basic income which is basically just like what if we had a society where everybody had the money to just have their needs met and then beyond that they could make choices about what to do there's also there's a subreddit called anti-work that has basically processed this sentiment and you know my ideas on this concept are not fully complete it's just something that i wanted to explore through this character so do you think jane's going into that with that as the end goal of the okay i i solved the puzzle i'm i'm in it now if i win this then i never have to work again and i can figure my life out or do you think that's even a step too far do you think it's just i'm here i want to just work on this puzzle now for what it is if i win i get this life-changing sum of money and then i don't need to worry about anything I don't need to worry about where I'm going to work next week. I'm going to pay for rent. Just like I'm going to be able to live and exist on this planet. Yeah. I mean, I I do think that's part of her motivation because I don't imagine that she's, she's not unaware of that aspect. She has this dynamic with her parents where she knows she has this pressure to work because this is a feeling that I've had too. like, well, anything that I do gets run through this filter of, how can this be my job? Yeah. It's funny. I actually just saw a post about this. Like other Americans, do you all feel the pressure to monetize your hobbies? Oh, so I think you and I have talked about, uh, one of my favorite hobbies is shooting film photography. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think I'm decent at it. You know, I, I enjoy the things that I shoot and I've had people tell me that, you know, they also like it, but at the same time, it's hey, your photos are great. Why don't you do this as a living? And it's like, I want to have a hobby that's maybe adjacent, but I don't need that to immediately make me money and turn into work. Because the second it turns into work, it changes the perception of how you actually feel about it. And this podcast is a great example of, oh, if we didn't didn't have to make any money, what what would we do? Let's just do a screenwriting podcast. Exactly. It's not necessarily like the, the smart career move we were making or anything. We were just like, we really want to do this and i think for jane she's not doing this out of desperation she's not participating she is genuinely the person who just wants to solve a puzzle so what's actually ironic is that linwood the whole point of our movie is that we have developed a way to monetize historians and scuba divers and like all of these sort of niche things But I think that that is actually a point of tension for Jane where when she's doing really well, let's say, well, Hudson might reach out to her to want to recruit her because let's just, let's just say that she's the smartest on our team of protagonists. And she's like, no, if I win, I'm not doing this. I'm doing whatever I want and not just like playing into this monetized system with all these rules and complexity to it. So you bring up an interesting point, which I hadn't even thought of. Would you see Hudson or any other teams trying to poach these people who are on the the grant team for their own teams? Or do you think there's a a layer of separation so that maybe they don't know who won the grant program until the very first moment? Or I don't know. I'm just trying to think if there would be any way where these people who have gotten a free ticket because they are so intelligent and they've proven that they could be an asset to any team would those teams try to steal them? Definitely not with Hudson's ego would he initially do it. But if we're thinking about the things that he's doing as the treasure hunt is not going his way, I would think him trying to poach people uh, would just be one of his tactics or just buy them off. You know, I can pay you $300,000 a year to work for me. And uh, at that point where if that, you know, that comes later in the movie, at that point, she's already formed these relationships with her other team members on the protagonist team. And she's like, no. I think that's really interesting. I think we sh- will add that to our list of possible story arc moments later, but I really like that. Yeah. I have a feeling that some people are hearing what I'm saying on Jane and that it like really clicks with them and they relate to that. Or you have no idea what I'm talking about. Or they hate you. But I think that 
because I actually have some trouble explaining this character and what I mean, I think just my role in the script will be uh, interpreting how I feel about this into the script, into this character. And that's just, you know, maybe I'll just take a second to just point out that like, sometimes that's the, I mean, that is the way that artists express themselves. Definitely. That's, I'm not just coming out and saying what I mean. I'm not making some policy proposal. I just, I feel like I know this character and the dynamic and I'm just going to help write her to explain what I mean. I think it's so funny because we talk about these characters as if there's certain right answers to how we develop them. But a lot of it is just exploring questions that we have and trying to figure it out for ourselves, which means their confusion can also be our confusion. Yeah, because this is also not set in stone. And I think that we will get to know this character once you start writing words that come out of her mouth. Definitely. All right, let's let's bring in Bobby so that we still have some time to talk about the three of them. So our final character that we're looking at is temporarily named Bobby. We have him in his mid-50s, uh, somebody who has already retired. But his main motivation, what he's looking to do, is just companionship with others. Uh, he is, a again, a smart individual, but not necessarily book smart or it, like prodigy smart like drain but somebody who is more crossword word game wordle king type similarly to jane i think he's kind of defined by his lack of work if you will i went a little bit differently with this one though i'd imagine that he had started a company some sort of startup when he was young some sort of easily sellable business which he then sold and made a ton of money off when he was you know late 20s early 30s and from that was able to coast through life and just retired then. Now, I don't imagine that he's stupid wealthy by any means. You know, he's not multiple homes type of wealthy, but he's done enough where he re recognized his living expenses. I was like, well, if I stay within my means, I don't have to work. I don't really have a lavish taste. I'm not trying to do all these crazy things. I can go on vacation every once in a while, but it's for him, it's never been about spending superfluous amounts of money. It's just about being able to do what he likes you know, go on little adventures here and there, nothing too crazy, but never having really to work. However, that lifestyle has proven lonely. Definitely. And I think from that, he's never had kids. I imagine he's maybe gone through a couple of relationships, but nothing that ever really solidified into a family-esque relationship. Mm -hmm. I always imagine he's kind of that jovial elder that, you know, can go to the coffee shop and be a regular, but not one of those creepy dudes when if you work in retail, they just keep hounding you at the store and you're like, please leave me alone. Don't come back. But they just continue to hang out with you because you're their friend. Oh, so have you ever worked in re retail? Have I worked in retail? What gives it away? Which is, I mean, honestly, that that, that is so sad because the you have to talk to them. Honestly, retail was a very informative experience and I feel like I could make Bobby just out of the people that I met from the multiple retail jobs that I worked. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the best examples of this is I worked at Apple for two months. I know you know this, but this is a- Wait, two months? Only worked there for two months. But in those two months, I met a lot of really kind elderly people who would come in to either try to get a phone to you know use FaceTime to talk to their family, or they had uh, an iPad just for Facebook to keep up with their friends. But every time it always turned into a really good just conversation about whatever their life was whatever it was that they were trying to use this for and who they were trying to keep into contact with. And elderly people done right are some of the friendliest, kindest, talkative people in a good way. Done right? <laughs> done right. Because, I mean, there's definitely some really, really crazy yeah, elderly okay. people. But the, all the people that I met from that experience of working at Apple were what I have in mind for Bobby. Of this person who comes around, you see them. They're so happy to see you. They don't take too much of your time. They, they know their place they have the social cues but they're there to just be a pleasant force and they're there to help achieve a mission and that's right. what i imagine with bobby he's the type of person who can go and and hang out with people go to the, like experience life at the coffee shop bring a book with them read a little bit have a few conversations maybe play a game of chess with somebody who's nearby and then go home but when they're when he's back at home it's that that loneliness mm -hmm. so this competition was something that he might have found late and solved quickly but when he got in and you realize, oh, I, I'm going to be on a team with other people, it made it that much worth, that much more worth the while. And if I can bring Jane back into this, so 
Jane, I said, has this tension with her, her parents, not understanding her and giving her the space she needs. Bobby has a Jane shaped hole missing in his life, but it's not just the, I never had a dad. You're my father figure. There's something about these two characters that really are a foil of each other. Bobby, who sold this company, who's been just lonely in retirement, who understands what that life is like and understands that just having that space of not needing to work. Um, I mean, through the opposite perspective of like a wealthy retired person um, is like the perfect father figure for Jane, who is smart in many of the same ways and is trying to find her way into that lifestyle. Definitely. And I think this is a perfect segue into our possible arc moments. Mm -hmm. So now that we have the, you know, broad strokes of the protagonists themselves, uh, I, I went ahead and tried to establish a few moments that we could see taking place over the course of the story. Uh -huh. And the oh, first, and let me just point out that we didn't speak as in depth to Alice's experience because we do not have her experience. Not at all. No, not in the slightest. And that's kind of what we were saying at the beginning about we need to do this research and make sure that it's not, oh, let's pick a marginalized community by throwing a dart on a map. It's let's do some genuine research, find out, talk to people that we know, get real experiences and be able to integrate those into the story. So this is a truly specific person, right? not just a, a you know, summarization of so many different experiences people have. Right. Uh, but yes, Continue. definitely. Yes, arcs. Uh, arcs. And I think building off of your point about uh, Bobby and Jane, I think one of the moments in here would be that sort of pushback, the establishing of boundaries and, and that conversation that they have of, you know, it's not deliberately trying to be your father figure. And I think Jane would maybe have a moment of just like, you're not my parents. Don't try to tell me what to do or what I'm supposed to be experiencing. You know, that pushback and creating that little bit of, of uh, tension in between the team in order for them to, to come together at a later moment and see eye to eye about each of their perspectives and what they were trying to bring to one another, mm -hmm. which I think is a pretty clear moment that we could have kind of woven throughout building as they're maybe struggling a little bit. Yeah. And then especially when Jane, if Jane gets this offer from Hudson, does she tell Bobby? I mean, there's this whole triangle to figure out when we just when things go wrong when we throw a wrench in it at some point does alice feel like she would rather just liquidate the remaining eighty thousand dollars yeah because she just is demoralized and feels like hey that's already life-changing money to me in my country can't we just be done with it so there's all of these things that we can throw their way that only by really knowing these characters can we figure out how they would navigate that. Right, definitely. I think that liquidation is a point too that I want to work in there. And I think what you brought up earlier about maybe Hudson trying to poach a person or two is another way we could do that in the, the same vein. But I think that idea of that all is lost moment where we have a new offer. It's either we can take the money we have now or you know we can take this lucrative offer from another team something where there's going to be a decision for them to make. Do we keep going and keep trying to play this game and maybe come out better? Or do we just quit now, cash out now? Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is an obvious thing to talk about, though, and they're, they're all going to have their moment where they shine in their specific way. Whatever skills are specific to them, they will have their moment to show what put them onto this grand team. Mm -hmm. And then the final thing, which I think should be definitive, but I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. I think the team has to split up one way or another, meaning one of them bows out. I don't know if that means that, you know, Bobby dies or somebody goes missing or, you know, somebody ends up in the hospital. Just something where they get separated for a period of time where the other two people in the team have to reconsider what it means to be on this team. And maybe that's leading up to the all is lost moment, but we'll have to decide a bit in the future. I just feel like it needs to happen where they get split up. Right. Man, one th like we have this just like buffet of possible conflict here. Yeah, I mean, I mean, what like we went over in the last episode all the different things, and I want to assign actors to them as soon as we can because it'll just Definitely. help me picture them and know them a little bit better. And I just want like this is really the part where it's getting fun. This podcast is getting yeah 
real. The movie idea is getting real. I'm daydreaming about it. And I hope it doesn't feel like we have just been chiseling away at a rock that isn't moving. Because every episode so far has really done a lot for us. And moving forward, the next thing we have is just the plot structure. Mm -hmm. And once we get through that, it's down into the nitty gritty of writing. Right. Because one thing that we felt that we didn't know when we first launched the podcast was we really wanted to get to this this point or next episode's point to really bring people on because we felt like i mean we are making it up as we go that's like literally yeah. what the yeah what the show is we're but, phonies <laughs> but there was just so little to like sink your teeth into and engage with early on but now it feels like you know here's some characters here's their descriptions and i think that from the audience we're going to see more ideas flowing definitely so let's say for these three different characters i'm going to solicit real life experience from these three characters that we've explained to you so far you know we don't have a lot more in mind than this i want to hear stories from the audience do you know someone like this are you this person do you relate to them and so instead of being in this hypothetical space, I just want to call on authentic life experience. We only have our limited scope of what we've experienced right. as two white American boys. Right. Do you have a dot? Uh, do you have a dog? Do you have a dog that reminds you of Bobby? <laughs> do you, have, do a, you have, a, have a parent that reminds you of Bobby? Do you have a sibling that reminds you of Jane, et cetera? I just want to hear some stories. Definitely. Stories make the best scripts. Yeah. Oh, scripts are stories. Are you just learning that? Quick, do the readout. Do the readout. Thank you so much for listening to Plot Matrix. We will be placing a poll on our Instagram story. Who has the better mustache? Next time you see me, this is going to be jet black. <laughs> That's not going to make it look fuller. It's going to make it look so much better. That Instagram account is at Plot Matrix. You can find the show on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. Your hosts are us, Jackson Casimero and Brian Smale III. This is a production of Lunation Lab. Learn more at lunationlab.com. See you next week. <laughs>